Well, everyone, welcome. Today we're going to start our webinar here. My name is Chris Haugen, and I'm from Rainbow Scientific Advancements here. I'll be kind of your moderator, if you will, and working through any uh, uh, any audio, visual, or IT questions that come about. Um, certainly, as with any technology, um, if we should have some sort of an issue where maybe uh, it, it uh, freezes or the internet crashes, who knows what, just stay calm. Um, we'll get it back up and running as quickly as possible, and we'll get you taken care of so that uh, you can learn a little bit more about Spotted Lanternfly today. A little bit of housekeeping real quick. So uh, at the bottom of your screen, depending on how you have it arranged, but most often with Zoom webinar, it's at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a couple of options, one that says chat, one that says raise hand, and one that says question and answer. Um, please do use the question and answer box to put in um, your CE or your ISA uh, identification or any any questions that you have while we're coming uh, through the webinar. We do prefer that you use the question and answer for questions, primarily because it allows us to make sure that we don't miss any. You know, we can click off that, yep, we saw your question, we're going to answer it at the end, or maybe we'll answer it directly within the chat if it's appropriate. This webinar is being recorded right now, um, and uh, uh, a link will be sent out afterwards in case there's maybe something you missed, heard, or you wanted to listen to it again, or maybe you wanted to provide it to another colleague. Be, be uh, more than happy to have you do that. This webinar is worth one ISA Arbor CEU. Um, if you didn't enter your ISA certification number during registration, please type that into the question and answer box now or before the end of the webinar, um, just so we can make sure that we get that entered and so that you get your ISA credit. Today, um, I'm very pleased to provide the introduction to two guest speakers. We have Greg Parra from the USDA APHIS on here as well, and we have Bob Dolan, RTSA's uh, uh, Tri-State Territory Manager on as well. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I'll push it over to you, Greg, to take over and uh, kick it off. Okay, thank you. Let me get this squared away. Okay, there's it. It up yet? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, my name is Greg Parr. I work with the USDA. I'm a staff scientist. I work with the Science and Technology Group with uh, USDA PPQ. I'm located in South Carolina. And uh, Spotted Landfly is one of my areas of responsibility. Since it was uh, initially confirmed in Pennsylvania in 2014. So today I'm going to covering some information which has been presented in the previous webinar uh, webinars in this series of Rainbow Tree. Uh, some of this will be based on research outcomes and some will be trends based on observation. So I'm speaking as uh, someone who's been involved with the groups conducting the research and uh, program activities. So I'll, I'll be jumping back and forth with information today as I sometimes I find it a challenge to present information in a very nice specific order because there's a lot of interconnectedness um, with the different topics and the different um, different parts of um, research and um, observations. Just the best way to put it. All right, uh, I just want to make people aware there was this uh, special collection edition of uh, environmental entomology that has come out very recently. It contains a lot of very recent spotted lanternfly research. Um, and most of the people who uh, have submitted or have research in this are a lot of um, folks who have been working on spotted lantern life for some time since it's come to the United States. But there, it's a really good issue if you just want to get a, a really good overview of the most recent information. And also more recently, there was a, the third SLF summit, which has been held in Pennsylvania the, the previous two years. This year, of course, it was virtual. Uh, and then also there was an, a sort of an introductory webinar at SLF called SLF 101. And those both can be found on the stopslf.com uh, website if people are interested in that. Okay, and as you as you know, as you've heard before, that um, spotted lanternfly it belongs to the family Fulgoridae in the order uh, Hemiptera, which are true bugs. 
Um, it was found in Pennsylvania, first confirmed in the fall of 2014. So initial survey efforts were, of course, to try and delimit the infestation, try and figure out how far exactly uh, it might be present. Uh, this is, of course, in the fall. As people know, with the life cycle, spotted so landfly starts to go down uh, in the fall, especially when you start getting your freezing temperature. So there wasn't a lot of time to work on it in the fall, but um, you know, into the winter, trying to look for egg masses also, that, that was done. Uh, and then based on the population size, it was believed that it possibly could have been present there for at least two years before it was initially found. So of course, there was a lot of coordination of efforts uh, with the USDA, uh, with Pennsylvania, with Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, these initial efforts uh, from when it was first found. Uh, Pennsylvania immediately had quarantine measures in place, uh, and a lot of it was on the township level initially. Uh, we did get a lot of information from and reports, uh, you know, either from literature or from reports from South Korea, because it was also an invasive species in South Korea. So we thought there could be a lot of information that would be useful, um, knowing that it would probably, you know, similarly be an invasive species in Pennsylvania and in the United States. So we also knew, you know, that it had been introduced into Japan also, but there was quite a lot of more recent information out of South Korea. Uh, as people know, it is native to China. Uh, the initial uh, concern, of course, was for grapes. That was the, the primary focus in South Korea was on their grape production and the impact spotted landfly could have to um, have to their grapes. Uh, and just so people are aware too, I, probably you'll see in a lot of uh, introductions to some of the research and some of the other information that uh, there was a large increase in the expansion of spotted lanternfly uh, going from 2016 to 2017, or even going from the beginning of 2017 to the end. But some of that was based on the fact that they that Pennsylvania made the decision to move from township level to the county level, which of course that, that increased the area significantly when that occurred. And, uh, and then um, There was also concern, of course, beyond grapes to um, forest impacts and other agricultural commodities. Uh, and then also a huge concern, it's, it's happened over you know, several years, but it's really heightened this season uh, based on what you know, occurred last season, was movement, you know, uh, not non-natural movement, I guess I should say dispersal um, of eggs, egg masses or adults on, uh, by other means. And also there was concern too, uh, as, um, Time has progressed. Spotted lanternfly was introduced or was first found in Pennsylvania. Green industry, nurseries, um, and of course, public had either uh, the impact of spotted lanternfly to homeowners or on public spaces. And then, uh, as far as the states are concerned, also there was a, this big shift too in uh, the outreach that was needed, not only to you know their typical or their normal agricultural commodities and groups, but also to a lot of groups that they don't normally interact with or that those groups don't normally. Uh, pay attention to information out of the Department of Agriculture because they were also potential movers of spotted lanternfly. So a lot of uh, a lot of learning, you know, and working with industries that uh, the State Departments of Ag don't normally work with. Of course, what was initially known in, in 2014 that has progressed quite a lot. There's been a significant amount of work to better understand spotted lanternfly dynamics, um, and also you have to understand that where you know you can understand spotted lanternfly, spotted lanternfly on a general level, but there are a lot of differences which are important to consider. Depending on population levels, um, you know, it, could dis it disperses differently, uh, the different uh, host shift, um, landscape level, you know, whether you're in a rural area, suburban or urban, and then also your site, whether you're talking about being in a vineyard, a nursery, or um, another type of site. Okay, and this is just uh, two, two initial when the uh, quarantine was based on township level. So you can see it was a fairly small area in Berks County. And then the current map now, which is uh, through um, New York, I, the Northeast I, uh, IPM Center, showing you know the blue areas of the states that, uh, or the counties that currently have at least some spotted lanternfly or some level. And then of course, as people have noticed too, that some of these small purple dots we're showing where there are high ports of spotted lanternfly, but no confirmed populations. Okay. And then, of course, as people know, time, since it was initially uh, confirmed in Pennsylvania, you know, that it was uh, next was in Winchester in Frederick County, and then, and also, you know, in New Jersey and Delaware, and then, you know, uh, eventually to Maryland, but then to New York, uh, Connecticut, and um, Massachusetts. 
Okay, and uh, initially, after of course, um, a lot of research was initiated after it was confirmed in Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the steps that uh, Pennsylvania took early on in 2014 was to have an advisor group for consideration of control options. Uh, this was mostly based on the literature out of South Korea and a lot of different products that they tested. And as you've probably heard at the other webinars, Spy Lanternfly is, is there are a lot of products with Spy Lanternfly, uh, both the NIMPS and the adults. The, the issue is getting the product to them. So, and trying to look at some of the, um, the woodlots and forested areas in hindsight, uh, two products were brought up that had a high efficacy and then also good residuals, and that was Dyne Capuron as a systemic and Bifenthrin as a contact. And so in 2017, uh, there was a proposal, I mean, uh, the, I should say the trap tree methodology, which I'll explain in a second, uh, was really in a significant way in Pennsylvania. Uh, it was trialed out in 2015 and expanded in 2016, specifically targeting Tree of Heaven, which is a highly preferred host for spotted lanternfly with the idea, and also based on observations that there's a significant number of that will uh, go to uh, Tree of Heaven at a very specific time in the adult life stage or life uh, phase, and that um, you have a potential for impacting a lot of um, a lot of the population that goes to the trees at that time, and then reducing the number of the other uh, Tree of Heaven on that site, so that you're trying to concentrate spotted lanternfly just being attracted to the trees that are attracted with the insecticide. And the other trees are uh, usually killed through herbicide. There were some removals that occurred also, some removals that occurred after the herbicide. But the idea the number of Tree of Heaven down to the ones that were just treated. And then in 2018, there was a big shift also in terms of um, $17.5 million being allocated for uh, spotted lanternfly. And USDA um, came into Pennsylvania, uh, established four offices. There was also a significant um, staffing increase, and then also working with contractors, and then also setting up a national data collection tool, and then also trying to coordinate uh, communication with states that were involved at that point. And so right now, with, within, um, you know, coordination with the states and with USDA, uh, the program's currently targeting sites considered high risk for long distance movement, and then also trying to target uh, satellite sites for treatment to try and see you know, eradicate or knock down those populations in those satellite sites, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, smaller areas to, uh, to work. All right, and again, Tree of Heaven, uh, Atlantis Altissima, it's a highly preferred host, uh, as people have also heard that, you know, there's been research conducted showing it's not necessary for spotlight fly to have Tree of Heaven in order to complete its life cycle, go all the way to adults and egg laying and, and lay viable eggs. However, there does appear to be a significant impact or cost to the insect in terms of the number of egg masses that can be produced is significantly lower, and then also development is longer without tree of heaven. And these were, you know, in cage studies where um, the insect did not have access during its life cycle to tree of heaven. But in laboratory testing um, and other work in the field, it does really, uh, it seems like it's very highly attractive to tree of heaven, so it's still considered a, a um, a highly preferred host that uh, definitely during that period of time, the adult phase, they, they do tend to move toward Tree of Heaven. They're on it for a period of time uh, in September, and then they, they move off of it uh, following that period of time. So it definitely still seems to be uh, this strong attraction to Tree of Heaven. And then I also was going to point out that um, there is an updated host list. So if people want to know where incorporated uh, observations from um, from what has been seen in the in areas of the U.S. where spotted lanternfly is present, it's a really good publication. Uh, we have you know they are listed from previous uh, literature, but uh, this breaks it down. It's really nice that you, you know where eggs or nymphs or adults have been observed. And in some cases, you know, see like these. Uh, it seems like a large host list, but um, in some of these cases, uh, spotted lanternfly was only going to be feeding what's been observed. Uh, you'll see a lot of some evergreens on there also, some conifers, but in general, I, the, the consensus is now that, that those aren't really a, a, a good host for spotted lanternfly or even significant or, or a host of concern that they will be seen on them. But yeah, right, the uh, feeding is not apparent. Um, but of course, they can lay egg masses on them, which is the other concern. 
And at Spotted Landfly also it's considered invasive. It hasn't gone into other areas where there could be other hosts identified. And some of the research ongoing now is testing other um, tree species and then other agricultural commodities to see uh, if Spotted Landfly can feed on those. Right. And then also I would say too, like as far as um, hosts identified, that nurseries, it definitely seems that Styrex is a lot, that that seems they really like that uh, host if it's present in a nursery. Okay. And then going back to the trap tree methodology, just give you a, a, a quick uh, idea of the impact, uh, you know, and you can kill a lot of spider land fly with that, um, that treatment method. Uh, on the left here, this is, um, Spotted landfly mulch is what people are referring to it as, but it's a, a significant number of land and fly that are killed by a tree treatment. And it was up so you can see it is a lot of dead spotted land fly. It was like three to four inches thick. Um, the video over to the right uh, is basically um, this is a cork tree that was treated similarly with dinotetron. You're seeing the large numbers. And you kill, can kill quite a lot of spotted landfly adults using this method and also to uh, kill nymphs that come to that tree. But the, the issue in the heavy population areas, of course, is like you will continue to have spotted landfly come into that tree. So it's not like a, you treat it and you kill all the ones that are on it and you're done. Like they continue to come into that tree. All right. Okay, and moving on to um, an adult, uh, nymphs would be, this would be the same, the information I can provide is basically the same. They have this feeding tube, this proboscis that they feed with. Uh, this is a female, you can tell by the red valve fur down below, which the males do not have. But generally, I was just trying to give you an idea that they are liquid feeder, feeders, they're foam feeders, so they're right, no, no biting or chewing or like eating leaves or boring. It's a, a completely external insect from eggs to adults. And just make of them feeding uh, on this particular tree. You can see they're making use of the lenticels on the tree to feed with and just give me an idea of the proboscis is inserted into these trees and feeding. All right, and so going really quick through the life cycle, this is an example of in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, you have the egg masses, which are basically start off uh, egg laying about mid September and uh, when the adults die off, and this is the only thing that's left remaining. To you get into April or May of the next year, and yeah, until you get into April or May of the next year when hatch occurs, it's a long period of time, of course, uh, for the egg masses. And so that, that's another target for potential treatment uh, to get them before they actually hatch and start moving around. You have your uh, first instars that start to come out. Uh, of course, they're very small, very tiny. They hop uh, quite a lot in their movement. They also walk around, but yes, they are. If you've ever been around them and you can try and touch them or get them, it is like a flea. I mean, they just like they'll just pop off. Like you'll try and touch them and they're just gone. That's how how fast or how explosive their jumps are. And getting to second, third in stars, there is crossover in these. You can have like first through thirds present, and also you know you can have second through fourths present at a particular site. There's that change in coloration when they get to the fourth. You can start seeing the little wing buds uh, onto the sides of the insect before they're. Um, as they're moving, you know, maturing to adults. And all these life stages, they molt. They molt from one to the other. And then you get to the adult stage. Again, it's a very long life, a very long phase for the adults, you'll see. You know, it starts in uh, about mid-July and goes all the way till frost. So it's a very long period of time that they are adults also. And of course, there's lots of uh, heavy feeding. And with the nymphs, of course, they're on the more succulent, softer tissues. The proboscis is very small. They can't get into the heavier woody material, but also their feeding requirements aren't as high as when they start getting into the fourths and adults when they have extreme feeding requirements, which is why you have this massive honeydew production also with that, with adults. And then you get into the mating. Uh, like I said, the egg laying is usually seen starting in mid-September. And then you know the first uh, hard frost or freezing temperatures usually kills them off. Um, so the adults are not present. They they don't overwinter as adults in the areas they're in right now. All right, and then going back, really specifically focusing on the adult phase. You can see it's like I said, it was a, it's a very long phase. It usually starts in mid July. Uh, there is heavy feeding that occurs. They are not uh, reproductive when they first molt to adults. It takes time. There's a lot of feeding that goes on. 
uh, it's a time period when they will shift on to Atlantis from other hosts. And again, going from the nymphs to adults, it, it seems like there's a broader range of hosts when they're the nymphs and that starts to narrow down into the second and third in stars and the fourth is definitely a smaller a set of hosts that they can, they can be found on feeding. And then as you get to the adults, like I said they'll go down to a, um, a period of time where they will be, they will really seek out Atlantis and then following that, they spread out to a variety of other hosts. But, and the thought is possibly it could be, and then again, a lot of that's in the heavier uh, population areas. A lot could be because the reduction of food quality in Atlantis at that time, the tree is also starting to senesce. So maybe it's shutting down. So maybe they can't get as much nutrition as they need. Uh, again, they're really heavy feeders. So they need, they need a, lot of, uh, a lot of liquid. And then also this is important to note too, that when they do become reproductive and they are mating, that there is that difference in flight too, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit more. And then also the concern over risk, whether you have a mated female or not. Uh, and this is an example of two females, one's early, like in the early phase of adults, and the second is like later. So you can see there's a huge uh, increase in mass. Uh, uh, males do, uh, they also increase in mass too, but the females are it's really significant. And that's when you start to see that yellow coloration. So of course, the risk, uh, it probably is higher, of course, when they're the lighter uh, insects, which has been shown through other research um, compared to the, the, um, the heavier females. Of course, they, they can't fly as well or fly as far, but um, you know, the risk, of course, is higher with the mated females. And there is a dispersal time that occurs um, after mating where they do, they do go out more. They might um, not be laying egg masses at that time, but yes, they are, they are moving around a little bit more. But yes, but the flight bouts are considered to be much smaller, much greatly reduced with this heavier, um, right, with this increase in mass. And again, this is a lot of work that Julie Urban and her lab are doing. So they're trying to look at how that mass increases over time in the females and doing a lot of that. I understand maybe at what point or if that could be used as an identifier for when you might be at the point where the females have mated um, and would have uh, viable eggs also getting back to, to risk, but also looking at possibly ways to target the, um, the population. And some other examples uh, of where egg masses are found and the difference between old and new egg masses. Um, they definitely are on like the underside of branches as well as on the boles of the trees. Uh, some of the other work that's been done find you know, a significant number of egg masses up above three meters on the tree. So even though you see them down below, there's probably quite a significant, uh, significantly higher amount above in the tree. Um, they also, I have this picture of loose bark. They like to lay eggs under loose bark also. This new egg mass, you can see it has this new coating on it. So it's nice and light. It's all, it's all white here. It hasn't hardened off yet. Uh, there's a female uh, putting the coating on the egg masses. Sometimes they are covered completely, sometimes only partially, and sometimes there have been cases where they haven't been covered at all and they're not, not exactly sure why that occurs. It could just be the material that the, the female has or it could have been disturbed off the egg mass before it completed putting the coating on it. And then older egg mass, it's weathered. You can see it's like cracking and breaking up. And sometimes by the end, by the time it's, they're ready to hatch, that whole coating is completely off of them. And again, you know, showing that they like the underside of branches. This is a fairly large egg mass. Usually the females are laying like two, possibly three egg masses per female, uh, averaging about 30, 30 eggs, 36 eggs. And then here on, you can see on the red maple on the right, um, like I said, they only lay two to three per female. So you can see there are a lot of females on there. They also do like to lay egg masses, at least this is from observations, uh, next to old egg masses from the previous season. You know, and these again in the higher population areas. This is on a post in a vineyard. And then, you know, you've heard the stories too about the rusty metal. Uh, they like that, but there's also some thought that it's the coloration and not so much the rusty metal. They seem to like this brown color also. Okay, and then also when they first come out and they haven't scleratized, uh, just trying to point out to people that if you come across them as they hatch, they will be white. They'll be completely, same thing when they're molting to, from one face to the other, they can be completely white before they harden off. Um, this is just something that uh, people like to watch. This is an egg mass hatching out. This is done at our, our lab in Massachusetts. Uh, you can see as they pop out, they leave these little hatched doors. You can tell when the egg mass has been, um, when it's hatched. 
and again, they're all they're completely white when they first come out, and then they harden off and um, color up. I was waiting for the one to run off, and then we'll move on. All right. <laughs> Go on to the next one. All right. And uh, when they do hatch out, when they are hardening off, like I said, they do tend to stay around the egg mass. They do tend to stay on the tree where their egg mass is located, like initially. Uh, and they are, um, you can, there is some, a little bit of aggregation going on, like just following hatch. There's a period of time where they do tend to stay a little bit together. And also since they like this lush, like succulent material, they can, you can find them together a lot of times, like on the mid veins or on the, um, on the veins of the of leaves and also on like more succulent material below. Uh, this is also another potential target for treatment of these first in stars. Um, and also th there's this climbing behavior that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more. They, they have this cycle, this cycle of like going up and trying to get to the softer material to feed on, but then they, they either dislodge or fall off or maybe possibly because of the wind, they'll fall down below and then they climb back up and they climb back up and there's this cycle with the other nymphs too, but also it helps them uh, spread. Like they'll climb up um, the next, if they can't find food on the ground, they usually tend to go toward, um, they wanna go upwards. So they'll try and climb uh, the next vertical object that they encounter. All right, and just going, going through the other, some other photos of the other life stages. Again, um, seeing like uh, it's an uh, adult female with two males, uh, you know, the earlier instars and the later instars. And then a lot of the photos you'll see of them are these high number photos, whereas they pretty much really won't see that just because there's fewer numbers. So this is something that's really seen a lot. You know, when you get to it or higher population levels with this like large numbers clustering like this. All right, and then again, you've heard too about all the, the honeydew that's produced from the massive amount of feeding that goes on. You can you actually feel it raining down, covers all the, um, understory, uh, you get a lot of city mold growth. Again, you know, showing what, what the impacts are potentially in forest species to either understory or regeneration. This white material over to the side, this is on an Atlantis tree that it's only been seen on Atlantis where they're feeding that white uh, foamy material or material can described as a mixture of bacteria and fungi and can have a, a really strong fermenting odor to it. And then again, just with the amount of honeydew produced, that's not the sh the shadow of the tree that hunts a lot. And then, you know, the city mold growing on it. On the right is an example I like to give. There's a lot of tree of heaven, a lot of spotted land fall. There's city mold raining down over to the right. It's an area that has a lot of uh, uh, truck traffic. And there's an area where there's a, um, a company where trucks are leaving. There's a sign warning motorists of trucks on the road, but you can't see it because it's totally covered in honeydew and city mold. And then of course, with all the, um, uh, with a spotted landfly going to different areas and different states, there's been a lot of outreach, a significant amount of outreach, a lot of um, information that's gone out to try and make um, agricultural commodities and the public aware, but also a lot of businesses aware of how they can help or what they can do. Um, so yeah, lots of information. All right, and then going into the uh, biology and behavior, of course, it's important to better understand the insect in order to come up with um, control strategies and solutions. Um, these are some that are working towards that in the different states, um, all our cooperators, then also we get the different areas of research that they're involved in. The host suitability, you know, there's a lot of, uh, like I mentioned before, testing of other plants, other trees, other agricultural commodities to see if they are. Uh, hosts or a spot or landfly can survive on them or, or progress through stages. Um, you know, of course, this is adult behavior, because uh, of course the nips don't fly and the adults do, and trying to figure out, you know, the phenology across different sites and different areas, trying to understand um, how it progresses through its life stages based on, uh, you know, temperatures or the other areas where it could possibly be introduced to, and also looking at the dispersal and, uh, and especially the flight dispersal of the adults. Uh, host physiology, trying to understand what it is possibly that changes with the hosts as they're fed upon, but also possibly what could be attracting them to those specific hosts, different points of their life stage. I've already talked a little bit about the uh, tree of heaven question about whether it needs it or not. 
and the attraction, we, there has been a lot of work done towards lures um, and that's still progressing now. Uh, the hot trees that basically has to do with observation that in some, you know, in sites where it's present in higher numbers, it tends, spotted lamplight can tend to be on very specific trees, even though all the trees are the same. There's a reason. I'm not sure if we lost Greg there. Um, hold tight for a minute. It looks like we lost Greg. Uh, maybe his internet connection dropped off there. Um, we'll just we'll just kind of roll with the punches here as Greg gets logged back on here. Um, maybe Bob in the interim. Maybe uh, oh Greg's. Coming right back, so we'll just hold tight here, everyone. Sorry for that, but uh, we're good. Greg, you, we got you back. Okay. Did I drop off completely? Uh, you did momentarily there, uh, but uh, we got you back, so you can uh, jump back in and share uh, right where you left off um, if you want to reshare your screen again. Okay, is that on now? Perfect, yep, you're on surveying and trapping. I, I didn't know how much I missed it on the biology part. Did I miss that or not? Um, I think I think we were pretty close to done on uh, um, on uh, the, the biology yeah, part. Fine. I, yeah, I can continue then, yeah. Okay, perfect. We lost your screen again momentarily there. Sorry. That's all right. I get trying to find the right. No. Oh. Oh. Try this again. Now's it back up? Yep. Now yeah. you can do, yep, perfect. There we go. Right, and getting into uh, survey and trapping research, of course, that's a, you know, always trying to refine and um, work on uh, improving the trapping. And also, um, you know, of course, if there is um, an attractant that cannot be identified to help improve uh, the trapping, that that also be incorporated. Uh, and looking at also maybe pot potential for traps for the adult stage also. Uh, these are two of the traps uh, that have been used currently, the, uh, the um, circle trap you know, with a bag on top and then the um, bug barrier trap uh, wrapping the tree with the sticky side down. Uh, initially, there's a lot of sticky bands used. There's still public a lot of public use of the sticky bands. They are problematic as far as potential bycatch. Uh, so you know, they come out if people are going to use the other uh, sticky bands to um, put chicken wire or something around them to try and uh, eliminate that bycatch. And the traps are also important to uh, um, try and deter effect, but also um, there's the potential for using it for population reduction too. And the, the other uh, image on the right and the far uh, down below is uh, the sentinel tree traps. Just something that Phil Lewis from one of our uh, labs has developed. This is uh, something that's put out. It's a treated tree of heaven with dying You know, in areas just to determine if this potential of spotted landfly is there, maybe either based on a report of one being found, but then it has not been, um, no one actually caught a specimen, or there's concern that areas might have it that are close to areas that are known to have it, or, um, right, that there might be a concern of something having been moved to an area. So. Uh, states would use that to try and determine if they could catch some. And the idea is like they, the spotted landfly gets killed and drops in this container down below, which is why people might recognize as a tree ring. 
And then this is an example of the, the old sticky bands. This one's totally loaded with uh, the first instar nymphs. This is another issue with the sticky bands is that sometimes even if they get anywhere near this level, even if they're only like 30 or 40% full, uh, you can miss some of them that will just march over the top. And again, going back to that description of how they will come off the tree, climb back up, that's how the sticky bands come into use, but also the circle trap and the bug barrier. It makes takes advantage of that aspect of its biology by climbing back up, climbing back up so that you know get caught or get funneled into a trap. All right, this is something else that's more recent uh, using canines for detection. Uh, the one on the left is Lucky. That's a dog that's been used by Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture uh, to uh, mostly to train for egg masses or primarily trained for detecting egg masses. And the other, sorry, I don't, I don't know her name. Oh, <laughs> it's with the Trail Conservation Group out in Jersey and New York. The New Jersey and New York are, have been using these dogs even more this winter. There's also a study comparing them to how they detect as compared to uh, people. Okay, and then as I talked about too, the emphasis now with the program is more trying to protect uh, either adults or egg masses from, from moving long distances through other conveyances. So one targeted area course is rail, specific modal train yards or other rail yards where rail might sit for some time. So this is an example of like going on to the contact spray with biofensorin where there's a, a mister, I don't know if you can see it's applying along the edge into the vegetation where there are known populations of spotted landfly to try and reduce or eliminate them. And the truck below is a truck. I mean, the other one's a, a truck on a high rail system, but this is um, right, a truck for uh, spraying in other areas where we're trying to see um, you know, other, either the nymphs or the adult life stage using the contact. And of course, there are other groups working on very, site-specific treatment options um, for the commodities, for the green industry, and also the public to use. Um, also egg mass treatments. There was quite a lot of egg mass treatments done this winter in an effort to try and really knock down populations during that long stage of the life cycle prior to this out. And again, there's an example of a, a tree of heaven with a lot of, uh, you know, pretty good number of spot land fly on it. And right behind it, you can see rail. You can see uh, cars on rail. And this is something uh, I was bringing up also in terms of the pathway um, and predictive modeling. Uh, this is our map uh, from last Sunday during the progression based on degree days of when hatch was expected to occur. That gray area is we're predicting hatch to occur within the next seven days. Uh, the area below it is you're going to have more significant hatch, of course, from like one to 50% of what's what there. But as you can see, it's already up into Philadelphia, up into New York, and Harrisburg, and over to the west, you know, in Pittsburgh and in Ohio. And then also it's incorporating the Winchester area in, in Virginia. Then Penn State has one also. Their degree day model is on a slightly different base. So this is showing their progression over time and in percent uh, predicted hatch. So both these are available online. And then going out really quickly into biological control that is being worked on, being looked at. Uh, initially, there's two potential uh, biological control agents identified out of China. Our lab in Massachusetts is working on these. One is uh, Anastatus orientalis, the other is Dryanus sinicus. One is an egg parasitoid, the other is a nymphal parasitoid. Uh, the egg mass you'll see on the lower uh, left. Uh, you can see that the ones that have the holes at the top, those are the ones that have been parasitized that the uh, wasp has emerged from as compared to the normal hatch where you have that little, um, that little trap door, that little hatch that I was showing you in the other, when they were hatching out that video. And then the other, the nymphal parasitoid actually will parasitize the nymphs and then you're right, it'll grow inside of them. And then also there were some bio or some antimopathogens identified in, uh, in the field, from field to collect. One is Bavaria bassiana, and the other is uh, bat co major, and Ant Hayek and Cornell has been working on those. But that's still in process. There's been some trials of Bavaria bassiana products in the field, and that is still ongoing. And then the biological control is still going ongoing too. They're still working on, uh, on both of the, the, the control agents. And then getting into some of the reports too, where there have been other. Um, more general others uh, out that found uh, feeding on mostly on adults. Uh, of course, uh, spiders are in that mix too. I didn't have a picture of that. We have pictures of chicken, owls, 
but yeah, again, they're generalists, so they, they will have like a you know slight impacts, but it's not expected to be large. And then of course, there's been more work being looked at, specifically at Penn State at, uh, at birds feeding on uh, spotted lanterns a lot. And there's been some behavior observed too of like uh, getting rid of the wings before eating them, which you know, people aren't clear if that's sequestering of compounds in the wings that are unpalatable, or they realize now over time and they're learning that behavior to um, right as to what what to eat. Okay, right. and I think that was it for me. Sorry, I was trying to go fast to provide more time. <laughs> uh, one thing well, I should you, point out also um, is uh, when I was talking about, yeah. One, one quick note I was going to point out too is when I was talking about how it can differ in different areas uh, for people um, working on this or, or looking for spotted landfly, we have seen that in newer areas, they do tend to be more associated with Tree of Heaven, that they tend to be found on Tree of Heaven, and then they tend to be uh, found like for until the population is built. <laughs> So yeah, until they build to higher levels, they do, do tend to be more strongly associated with heaven. So just give people that information. And same thing with flight, that definitely seems to be impacted by population levels that um, usually that it's not typically seen in the lower population areas, but only when it gets to a certain level, that's when you, you'll see more of that flight that most people probably have seen videos, seen information on. Okay, sorry Bob, I'm done. No, no, perfect. Um, so, uh, Bob, uh, so we'll have Bob do a real quick couple of slides on some management and then we'll do some questions and we, looks like we've got a real couple of good ones in the, in the question and answer. So if you just stop sharing briefly, um, that'd be great. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm Bob Dolan. I cover New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware for Rainbow Tree Care Scientific. Um, I live in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, so I'm in the heart of it. Um, deal with spider lanternfly pretty much on a daily basis. I uh, just kind of wanted to walk you through some different um, management considerations and uh, go through uh, step by step and, and through the different products that Rainbow offers uh, to deal with it. Um, one of the main things you want to consider when implementing a, a, a management program in a commercial setting is, is going to be your client's tolerance. Um, some people aren't going to want to, to see any insects, um, which is very hard to do. <laughs> um, so making sure you're setting that expectation properly uh, with them is going to be key. Uh, and then others you know, may just want to make sure that their, their property is not getting damaged. They don't care if, if they see them. In addition to their tolerance, we got to take into consideration uh, where they're going to be in our landscape uh, based on their life cycle and different times of year. Uh, as Greg mentioned, you know, the, the nymphs are going to be more on that herbaceous plant tissue uh, doing their feeding, whereas our adults, they're going to be found more uh, on the trunks and main stems of mature trees feeding on that phloem. We have a lot of different tools in our toolbox. Um, some of them are, are physical tools like egg scraping and you know, use uh, sticky bands or traps. Uh, we have environmental controls like removing tree of heaven or other susceptible hosts um, that maybe aren't desired or, or needed in the landscape any longer. Um, and then we have our chemical controls, including you know, our cover sprays uh, on the foliage of shrubbery. Um, we have our main trunk and limb sprays to, do, to use as, as kind of knockdowns for our adults. And then we have our two systemic options, um, which are going to be TransTech bark sprays and TransTech infusible trunk injections. Uh, TransTech is a 70% dinotefuran. Uh, it comes in a water-soluble packet, so it, it makes it super easy for mixing and dosing. You don't have to worry about you know, wasting product, or I call it the glug-glug method, where um, some technicians like to add a little bit extra just to make sure. Um, so, you know, your dosing is always going to be accurate. Um, you just spray the lower five feet of the bark down to the root flare. Um, 
and that'll get a systemic control for about 90 days for spotted lanternfly, EAB, hemocalyte, delgid, uh, and scale. Um, we can treat up to 30, 30 trees in an hour. Um, and there is a special label for this uh, that allows us to treat three times the pounds per acre when treating for a tree of heaven um, in all of the states that now have you know, established populations. Uh, we have TransTech Infusible uh, at our disposal now, which is a, a micro injection. Uh, it's 22.5% Dinotefuran. Uh, it's a super small dose. Typically, we're seeing anywhere with a label uh, list one to four milliliters per inch, depending on DBH. Um, so very small volume. So the uptake is super fast. Um, and you see results you know, within a couple of days. Um, there is no pounds per acre restriction for it. Um, and it's great to use in maybe like a wetland scenario or other ecologically sensitive sites. Foliar sprays, we, we were able to see that pretty much everything will control them um, and knock them down um, as far as an active ingredient perspective goes. Um, but we did see uh, a little bit increase in residual with using bifenthrin, um, as Greg mentioned earlier. Um, so that's has kind of become our industry standard uh, as far as a foliar contact spray goes. Um, that's all I really had on, on management. Um, so if you want to take it back over, Chris, uh, we can go through our Q&A. Absolutely. So I will, as we get into the Q&A here, um, we got some good ones in here. So the first one we have is uh, for Greg, I think. Uh, has there been any work done on repellents? Yeah, initially there was some information out of South Korea. I think it was spearmint oil that possibly was a repellent. And so that was tried, but I didn't saw anything really significant or any effect at all. And then there was a compound that was identified um, in our lab in Massachusetts that looked promising in the lab, but in the field it didn't seem to um, right to have that effect because that yeah that's something that's definitely of interest too is not only killing them but maybe if you could keep them away from areas or from commodities especially vineyards uh, but yeah so far uh, there hasn't been any anything significant found as far as a repellent okay and then a question from john anderson was that a stink bug attacking a spotted lantern fly yes it was Sorry, I should have identified. There was a wheel bug, an assassin bug, and a predatory stink bug in those photos. Excellent. And last question uh, comes, uh, maybe Bob, this one might be for you. So the question is, with New Jersey encroaching on an all-out ban on neonics, neonicotinoid insecticides, what are, what are we thinking on methods for potential control? Um, from my understanding, from, from what I was most recently informed about uh, this topic was that spotted lanternfly um, and other invasive insects were going to be an exemption, um, but there's going to have to be a proof of infestation in order to use dinotefuran as those active as that control method. Um, but if if that's not feasible, I'm assuming we may have to go a little bit backwards in time, and we're going to be going back to old older chemistries like bifenthrin. Um, or permethrin, things like that, as of now. Okay. I'll put a quick plug in there. Um, we do have our Rainbow Scientific uh, Science Guide for Spotted Lanternfly. By all means, go ahead and, and uh, uh, download that. I'll drop uh, th this link into the chat here momentarily. Um, does anyone have any kind of questions here on the at the end as we close out uh, on the on the session today? Make sure to drop I your. Have, oh, go I ahead, Greg. Yeah, I got one more thing I forgot to mention during my presentation. Sorry. <laughs> Again, you know, it's looking at different population levels. Like I know the um, you know with other programs that I've worked in, a lot of the images and a lot of videos you'll see are like the you know the extreme example or the best example because that really has an impact whereas and if people are in areas where it's not present yet or maybe it's at low populations you would not you might not see that same thing where you're going to have like hundreds on a tree or they're going to be that uh, or you know or that visible so right just you know thinking about um, 
how the population or how SLF, uh, how it behaves under different situations. And then also trying to think about how it, how it moves or how it will respond like in a, in a residential suburban area versus an urban area versus a woodlot or, or so far has been very, very different. And that the, the mass flight you see, you might not see that either. Because that, that's been in the case too. And areas where it is present that even areas that are under quarantine, there's some people there that have not even seen spotted land fly or seen it flying around because it might just be in a very small area of the county or it just could be at such low levels you're not seeing that behavior yet. Because even in the first couple of years, we weren't noticing that flight behavior. And then all of a sudden, like in 2016, we started noticing more of it. And then like 2017 was the year, like you saw lots of it. And then in the vineyards, it, it does, tend to move in from the edge and go back out. Uh, so there is that movement between the forested area and the vineyard. So it, you'll see the pictures of like hundreds on a grapevine, but that's not always the case or throughout the entire vineyard. That might be more um, close to what you'd see on, on an edge or in the first couple rows. But yeah, it's a very, it's a, it's a very hard insect to, um, to work with. <laughs> As far as it not being, it's not uniformly distributed, or even at the site it's at, it's not uniformly distributed. So it's just, yeah, it's very, very challenging that you might see, again, you might see an area where you see very few, and then ultimately adults show up, and then you see a lot because they're coming in from neighboring areas. So, and same thing with your treatments. I was trying to explain that you can knock the nymphs down and everything looks great at your site. And then the, the adult season shows up and then you have a lot all of a sudden coming into your site and you treat and you're killing a lot, but they just keep coming in. You know, when you start getting into the higher population areas, I guess is what I'm saying. A question uh, from Bobby with the, I apologize, the, with the bug warrior, bug barrier, pardon me, bug barrier, has there been overload? It's probably that, possibly, I haven't seen it yet, but the um, we do have a nice image where it is really full, but I haven't heard any reports of that. The only thing I, I've heard as far as advice on using those is there's a foam, like a little foam, uh, I don't know call it a barrier, that extends it out from the tree. And so sometimes it's just a single wrap for most uses for the bug barrier, but for S. The left. I know the recommendation is to use three rounds of that around the tree so it extends out further because as you get into the larger life stages, the fourth and the adults, they just don't have enough room. So that gives them more room to crawl up under that and, and come around to hit the sticky part. But I haven't heard those being um, right, just totally um, overwhelmed. Or... No. But they do change them out like every two weeks, so I'll yeah, I suppose once it's no longer sticky or there's so many of them on there that uh, it doesn't uh, do the job anymore. Question, uh, what plans should right. communities have in place before SLF shows up? Maybe Bob, can, if you want to take that one. I can take this one. Um, my advice would be that a tree inventory would probably be step one to identify see how many of the host plants you have throughout the community. Um, if it's in more of an HOA kind of setting, um, I would bring the topic up to maybe start setting aside some dollars to incorporate for removals or begin removal process of the lampus or other host trees um, before it shows up. Um, and then you just kind of just have to have your ducks in a row for when um, you know the population starts exploding and you need to start doing something about it getting a firm understanding of everyone's expectations and tolerance for it is gonna be key in, in making sure everyone's satisfied with your treatment program. Um, the expectations is really the, the key to it and making sure they're properly set. Okay. If there's no more questions, we can uh, close it out. You know, I want to extend a, a thank you to you, Greg. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and taking time out of your day to, to share with us everything you know about uh, the life cycle and the research. And I think really providing us a nice background on kind of where we came from with spotted lanternfly and where we're at and potentially a little bit into where we're going. 
And thank you to Bob as well. Um, please do take five minutes for all of you attendees out there to fill out the survey at the end that follows after. Um, we do take those seriously and we do um, implement changes based on your feedback. So thank you again for attending and have a lovely afternoon, if it's afternoon for you or rest of the morning. Thanks everyone.